All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Hopefully you had a delicious breakfast. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to City, County, and State, Three Approaches to Food Waste Reduction. Before we get we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone of the cooking competition this evening in the Iowa Ballroom from 6 to 7.30. So today we have three panelists. They will be Linnell Ladd, Matthew Taylor, and Christina McDonough. So Linnell Ladd has been a pollution prevention specialist at Kansas State University's Pop Pollution Prevention Institute since November 2016. Her work at PPI includes providing food recovery technical assistance at, to industries and institutions, as well as environmental compliance assistance through the Kansas Small Permit Writer, Industrial Hygienist, and Air Quality Inspector. Ladd has a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology and Secondary Education from Emporia State University. So we're going to go ahead and let Linnell get started, and I will introduce our our next two speakers following. So everyone please give a warm welcome to Linnell. I just wanted to clarify what she said. I Part of our group is SBEEP and that's, I work with the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program. So it also at K-State. Okay, um, you know, so this session I guess is about cities, counties, and state perspective on food policy. And I'm assuming that my perspective that I'm going to talk about today is a little bit on the county side, but mostly um, or partially on the city side as well. Um, although I work for Kansas State University, and I'll explain how this all fits in, this is not about how our university is managing uh, food waste. Um, I work for PPI, or Pollution Prevention Institute, just to give you a quick rundown of how we are, in, where we are in the university structure. Um, you have the university, you have the Department of uh, um, um, Engineering, sorry, and Engineering Extension, and under Engineering Extension, you have the Pollution Prevention Institute, the Kansas Energy Program, our Radon Program, and Small Business Environmental Assistance Program. The work that I did um, in this past year with food recovery was under the Pollution Prevention Institute. So food production and food loss was what we were wanting to focus on. Everyone has seen the hierarchy probably several times yesterday, the upside down triangle. We were wanting to focus on food waste reduction, so prevention. And I won't show you that again, but in the studies that we did uh, this summer, we had four grant projects I'm going to only speak to you about one today, um, which was dealing with one county and a city in that county. Um, but we did have four different projects. Uh, two of them were from grants from the USDA that were on, focusing on solid waste. So we were looking at rural solid waste, and we were looking at rural grocers uh, and helping them reduce their solid waste, because we know that rural grocers have a difficult time nowadays, especially in western Kansas. We see that the grocers are 
either non-existent because they've been, you know, um, they they just can't afford to keep operating. And then you have, you know, um, the WalMarts and the Aldis and things that have come into bigger cities that are within an hour of most of the smaller communities. Uh, the other two projects we did were CDC grants that were uh, awarded to KDHE, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And uh, one of those grants was given to the county, which I'm going to be speaking on. And the other one was given um, to us as a sub-grantee to work with two other counties. So our focus was working um, from that health perspective as well, not just from the solid waste reduction. We were trying to make connections and uh, uh, find uh, coalitions to solve these problems. I'll, I guess I'll go through that. When I did the food waste and we had an intern from um, Kansas Univer University of Kansas that worked with me, um, we looked at the pre-consumer food only. And when I say pre-consumer food, this is food that, you know, has been uh, cooked and is either out on a buffet or it's food trimmings, but it's not the plate waste. This is not food that people are throwing in the trash already. This is food that's coming back into the kitchen from the buffet or, um, you know, that was prepared but never served to anyone, okay? And the reason why we looked at all of that, the trimmings and everything, and weighed all of that is because if it was, if it, to determine, you know, if it's edible for human or if it's edible for animal, because we were wanting to stay in that top tier of the pyramid. In Kansas, 17%, 17 and this is a 2016 uh, data from our Bureau of Waste Management, from, our, from Kansas Department of Health and Environment, 17% uh, of the food waste or that is by organic material or food waste that's in our landfills. So that's a pretty substantial number considering, um, you know, when you look at what else is in there. Uh, and some of that is also uh, organics as well, the yard waste, and they have that separated out. But food in general is almost 17% in Kansas, making up our landfills. And I was talking to some folks last night, and they were really surprised. Um, you know, I've heard some numbers from other states about, you know, uh, taxes on, on uh, waste and, and tipping fees. In Kansas, the tipping fee for waste, solid waste to the landfill is $1. So you can see right now that there is not a lot of <laughs> incentive to not haul things off to the landfill. So we have that first hump to get over in Kansas when it comes to any waste. Okay, the project I'm gonna talk to you about. Lawrence, um, the city of Lawrence, Douglas County Health Department approached K-State and asked us to work with them on finding, um, finding out what the food system was like in their public schools and at the University of Kansas. Um, we started the project roughly in October of 2017, but there was unfortunately some um, turnover at the Lawrence uh, Douglas County Health Department, and so it got off to a really slow start, unfortunately. But uh, we secured a University of Kansas uh, environmental student to help me with this project. And um, we got started in about January in getting into the schools, meeting with the food policy councils. Douglas County is situated in what we call Northeast Kansas. Um, and it has a population, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but um, in Douglas County, um, the Northeast Kansas corridor is served by a, a large food bank called Harvesters, which is located in Kansas City, Missouri. So we quickly had tried to identify who we needed to partnership with um, to get some of this information that we needed to know what is already being done in the county and then what we can effectively help them achieve beyond what they are doing right now. So Feeding America, because Harvesters is a Feeding America food bank, we partnered with them and contact with them, and I'll talk more about that. 
Um, we worked with the Douglas County Food Policy Council. Just Food is a fairly large uh, food bank in Lawrence, and they also have a kitchen. So they were integral in part of our processes of getting the food from the public schools to in, um, needy uh, populations. And then, of course, our, our funder, the health department. Douglas County has about 121,000 people, and that's roughly not counting the college students in town. There are three universities in Douglas County. We have the University of Kansas, which has a student population of about 27,000, I think, is the last number I saw. And then we have uh, the Indian Nations, Haskell University, and then in a town located in the southern part of the county is Baker University, which is a private university. So Douglas County is a pretty busy community, but as you can see, and this is information from um, Feeding America, the percentage of food insecure. Um, so when you're talking about uh, the total population and the child insecurity rates in Douglas County is fairly high, 18%. Um, is everyone here from the Midwest, basically, or from, you know, rural, you know, breadbasket? You know, I see these numbers and I'm like, how can that be possible? We live in the breadbasket, you know. Of the, I mean, we are the producers in this, you know, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska. How can we have these kind of numbers? Um, but it's true. So we, for the county having, you know, three universities and a, and a very diverse and, and forward-thinking city, um, their sustainability programs at the university and in within their city government and the county government are really very good. Um, we still have a lot of things going on here. So building the coalitions and trying to find how to best connect people because communication still is one of those barriers that that we are that I found um, we, we don't have all the groups talking with each other and making plans together but with with those public schools that we worked with we sat down with the USD 497 food managers from all the schools and laid out a plan of which schools that we would um, observe and do our uh, food recovery weighing and observations and recommendations. We sat down with the Food Policy Council to see what, you know, what actions they had done in the past and where they plan to take some things in the future. And of course, Just Foods is a local, fairly large um, food bank there in Lawrence that had been working with the schools already with donations, so we felt it was really important to include them. They have a kitchen and are capable of taking prepared food. That was another one of the huge benefits. When you, when you have prepared foods, it's one of the most difficult things to find, uh, you know, somebody, a recipient to take those because if you, you know, and especially if you don't have the transportation, that was another barrier that we, that we ran into in, in this project. Okay, so in the public school system that we looked at, we looked at one high school, two middle schools, and four elementary schools. The reason why we focused on these is because there are two public high schools in Lawrence, and each one of them kind of served their area. So. This was Lawrence High, and it served all the schools in East Lawrence. So they ordered for all the schools in East Lawrence. They made sure that all the food that was shipped in for preparation was sent to each one of these schools for preparation. So the high schools in Lawrence kind of act as the food hub for all the other schools. So when we were looking into how things are done at the schools, you know, at their written production records, um, was one of the things we recommended that they increase their production records or the, you know, the information that they have about how much is produced on any given day. Um, the schools are not using these computer-based programs. 
Um, you know, a lot of it is still kind of handwritten information and calculation of how much they need to order and things. It's not like you would see maybe in a hospital that has uh, contracted with a food servicer um, for a computerized program for ordering and production rates. Um, they, they have a three-week lunch schedule and a two-week breakfast schedule, and what I mean by that is, you know, they have kind of a rotating menu. So it rotates for three weeks for the lunches, and it rotates every two weeks for the breakfast. And that includes both high school and elementary. All the schools are practicing self-serve, so that's good. Um, and, you know, some of the schools were practicing, you know, kind of a fair share uh, where, you know, we wanted uh, the student, they want the students to not take more than their fair share. And, but they don't do lunch count anymore. I was shocked about that. I'm old school <laughs> and um, I was surprised that they don't do lunch count anymore. Okay, so I've been talking too much. I've got five minutes to wrap the rest of this up, guys. This is the data that we found, um, and I just want you to know that a lot of the produce was not, it, it really was based on trimmings. This weight and this CO2 equivalent uh, calculation from EPA's GHG calculator, that was mostly trimmings or things that we would have normally um, evaluate as not humanly, you know, not human edible and, but, you know, could be animal edible. But, the, but these are extrapolated numbers based on our observations from all the schools that we visited. And, um, you know, that's 11 tons of food that could be reduced every year. So that's production, reduction. Um, of that, we estimated that 2.3 of it could, could be donated to, to people and or animals, and 0.4 of it was already being composted. Some of the schools had vermicomposting, uh, verma worm composting going on as sort of a science education thing. Okay, University of Kansas, again, this just shows our building coalitions, who we, uh, you know, contacted, sat down with, KU's Office of Sustainability, the Dining Services, Just Foods, and the Health Department. And uh, we looked at three of their major dining areas, and this is what we estimated, we extrapolated out for the year, and... Um, you know, the South Dining is one of their newer dining, I believe, and it's, you know, there was a lot that we estimated from there because they're handling a lot of students. Again, there's, a, you know, close to 20 some thousand, uh, 27,000 students at KU. So you kind of have to, those numbers look big, but you got to think about how many students they may be feeding daily. Okay, the conclusions, you know, we really think that everybody should be used, if they have these computerized systems, they should be using them to the, the fullest extent that they can. Uh, there's a lot of times employees override that and make more than they should. Um, communication is a problem sometimes in the schools. You know, maybe there's a field trip and the kitchen doesn't get notified. Mm -hmm. And then so... A hundred kids are gone today, and they made meals enough for a hundred kids, and they were told by no one that those hundred kids were not going to be there. So that's why I was shocked there was no lunch count, because back in my day, and maybe some of you in here remember getting, you know, you had to tell at the beginning of the day whether you're going to eat lunch or not, so that the kitchen knew. Um, On-site policies are still kind of challenging. We have, um, you know... It's good that they that the, the food safety is more restrictive, maybe than the than the law requires. But it means things are getting pulled sooner, and if they're not being donated, they're just being thrown in the trash. But they could be donated. Um, buffet buffet service. I don't think that's anything anybody would know that that's still a, one of the biggest problems because of overproduction there. Um, also, people are still scared in Kansas to donate, even though we have the we have it. You know, we have a law that allows you to safely donate. Um, 
And then we did work with uh, Feeding America and their Meal Connect in Northeast Kansas to get everyone kind of going on that. We spent the last part of June visiting um, harvesters, agency partners, and training them on the Meal Connect app, app and trying to get everyone on board with that. So to make that connection so people would know who they could call or, or you know, who would take food donations. We have new guidance on our website. Check it out. It's sbeep.org. That's S-B-E-A-P dot O-R-G. This should all be available. And just a sneak peek at what those are. We developed a guidance document for school on food recovery and universities on food recovery. And we do have a new map that if you click on it, you can see why your local, uh, if you're in Kansas, you want to know where the local uh, food banks are and stuff in the state. You can click on the county and get that information. We're still filling it, so. And that's it, guys. Any, well, I'll wait till uh, late for the questions, so thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Matt Taylor. He is a senior policy analyst with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices. He works with TDEC, TDEC. I should have practiced reading. Okay. I should have read these beforehand. Uh, divisions and external stakeholders on complex environmental policy issues and are responsible for coordinating. TDEC reviews and responses on NEPA projects in Tennessee, as well as development and administration of the Get Food Smart Tennessee program. Matt holds a master's degree from the University of Arkansas, focusing on climate change, and a bachelor's degree from Texas State University. Please help me welcome Matt. Good morning. Um, I apologize if, if I uh, sniffle and cough my way through this. I'm getting over a cold and <laughs> I'm actually kind of an idiot because I only had um, NyQuil in my travel kit and so I took a NyQuil this morning. So I, I may also fall asleep during this presentation. So, um, Well, thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and speak about um, Tennessee's food waste efforts and also the development of our um, new program, Get Food Smart TN. So I'm a context person. I apologize if this background seems extraneous, um, but I wanted to, to provide you with a history of our near-term efforts relating to food waste and then kind of the path that we took um, to get to the development of Get Food Smart TN. <laughs> Excuse me. So the genesis of, of a lot of our efforts to address food waste was the development of the state of Tennessee's 2025 Solid Waste and Materials Management Plan. So the plan was adopted in April 2015, non-regulatory, but it acted as our strategic roadmap containing broad objectives and ideas to reduce disposal and increase diversion and recycling in the state of Tennessee. So objective four of the plan um, broadly was focused on increasing diversion of organics. And this included everything from encouraging composting to source reduction to food recovery. So some of the initial tangible actions that came out of this, this you know, first uh, commitment to reducing food waste was in 2015, we developed a composting grant, which um, the next year, through that grant process, we awarded five composting grants totaling about 2.5 million. Um, we also identified state parks where uh, composting should be prioritized because they had on-site dining facilities. And just to give you some background about our state agency, so we're a fairly robust environmental agency in that we house both the state of Tennessee's um, environmental regulatory programs but also the state of Tennessee's cultural and natural resource conservation program. So we actually have, you know, air pollution control and archaeology and state parks. So there's there's some cool opportunities there to um, leverage the the organization that we have. 
And then also in 2015, we, following the release of the plan, we embarked on updating our composting regulations. And so by summer 2016, we promulgated new composting regulations that were less burdensome on small operators. <coughs> so, you know, we, we came out of the gate running after the release of the 2025 plan, um, and, but a lot of it was composting focused. So in 2016, we held a round, we held a, a full day stakeholder event, and that included a midday roundtable discussion and then a evening public outreach event. And so the goal of the roundtable discussion was to identify opportunities and obstacles to um, reduce food waste, recover, and uh, divert food waste in Middle Tennessee. And so through that process, we engaged local governments, industry, nonprofits, um, educational institutions. We had um, about 40 representatives from an eclectic mix of organizations, including Bridgestone Arena, the mayor's office, um, Vanderbilt University, Chamber of Commerce, a number of others. And then that, that evening, we held a big public outreach event at the Nashville Farmers Market where um, we hosted a screening of the film Just Eat It. We had local exhibitors, the mayor's office made an announcement, um, the mayor's office of Nashville made an announcement um, about their commitment to reducing food waste. Our commissioner made an announcement and then um, we had a, a meal that was prepared using gleaned vegetables. So that was pretty cool. Um, and one of my friends made this kind of cool punk rock flyer for the event and surprisingly the state let me put our logo on it. So. I was pretty excited about that. Um, so so though that full day of events um, kind of galvanized our um, leadership's interest in food waste. And I say that because, you know, both the, the midday roundtable event and then the evening event, which had about 200 attendees, um, I think conveyed to our leadership the interest the community has in dealing with food waste. <laughs> Excuse me. So one of the outcomes from the midday roundtable um, discussion was we developed a report on areas of focus slash recommendations for TDEC moving forward with respect to how we should prioritize our focus on food waste. And so a lot of the things that we heard were not things that um, we were unaware of. So we knew infrastructure was an issue. We knew education was an issue. We knew the cost factor was an issue. But there's a couple of other ideas that were um, born out of this roundtable that we hadn't necessarily thought of. So creating a recognition program, um, you know, targeting schools, and then developing a state steering committee. And, and uh, this report is available at that link under the assumption that you will have access to the, the presentation. So on the same day as the October 6 um, roundtable event, we also released a white paper, which was essentially an effort to catalog ongoing um, wasted food and food waste efforts upstream of composting in the Southeast United States. And so, um, again, nothing too, too shocking in this report, but it was good to identify what other states were doing and see how we stacked up against them. And so, you know, from that report, we, you know, learned that the primary groups tackling food waste in the southeastern states are non-governmental organizations. There are very few formal food waste efforts um, being led by state or local governments. That's changed a little bit since 2016. South Carolina has a really awesome Don't Waste um, Food SC campaign. And I know Atlanta, Charlotte, Nashville have also um, embarked on efforts at the city level. But this white paper also provided nine recommendations for TDEC leadership <laughs> to address food waste um, upstream of composting. And thankfully, the roundtable recommendations and the recommendations from this, a number of them paralleled. So um, we had some really good ideas for moving forward. Um, so around this same time, uh, December 2016, we were made aware uh, a core group of us that are kind of working on food waste at the state agency were made aware of some excess grant funds um, available in our 
state recycling program. And so we, using the roundtable report and the white paper, um, went to leadership and advocated for those funds to be dedicated to addressing food waste. And, and we were luckily successful in that. So in early 2017, we developed a first of its kind grant for our um, TDEC recycling program in that we made it open to both public and private. No grant in the past had ever been offered to, to private. Um, now they had a, a much higher match than public, but um, we were able to get that in there. And then also we made funding available for everything from food waste awareness and education to diversion to recovery. And so that was kind of a lesson learned from our composting grant, um, which didn't have a huge uptake. And so um, by early 2018, we were able to award um, about $3.8 million in grants. I think there's 15 projects funded. Um, I highlight a couple here. Uh, Country Music Hall of Fame actually applied for funding to set up organic collection receptacles um, in the, the public areas, which, you know, low impact in terms of what's being captured, high visibility projects. So there's lots of people that are now being ex exposed to the concept of separating out your organics that, that probably haven't experienced that. Um, we funded a couple of composting projects. We um, made a large grant to our major local food bank. And then we also um, provided funding to our state gleaning operation. <laughs> so, you know, we're kind of late 2016, early 2017 in full court press at this point. Um, and we're kind of going down the list of recommendations that we've developed through these two reports. So the next thing that we wanted to consider was development of um, a state recognition program. So I, I should preface this slide to say that I am not speaking negatively about the Food Recovery Challenge platform. Um, our state parks are all enrolled in it. I think one of them was maybe even an award winner this year. Um, but in terms of what we were trying to accomplish, we didn't think it fit our needs. So um, our initial thought to developing a state recognition program was that we could leverage the Food Recovery Challenge platform um, and base some sort of program off that. And the idea being that FRC already exists, it already has a system to collect data, and we could just use that data to run a state program where we recognize people. Um, and then there's a much lower investment for us on the front end. And so we went through the process of investigating this and um, looking at the platform, we spoke to Region 4 staff, headquarters staff, and realized that it was gonna be a fairly convoluted process to be provided access to the data. There is no FRC logo and EPA, I guess in these circumstances doesn't allow for co-branding. So that was gonna be another challenge. And then um, we also wanted to um, capture smaller organizations and we were much more focused on people taking actions that maybe didn't necessarily correspond to uh, quantitative impacts. And so we, we didn't want the quantitative nature of FRC, even if we ended up focusing on, on the, running the program off that somehow, um, to exclude maybe mom and pops that don't have the, the capacity or the resources to measure their food waste. So we reached out to a few other state environmental agencies participating in the program as endorsers, just to see if they had come up with any creative ways to leverage the platform, kind of like we were thinking, and um, None of them were doing that. And so based on this assessment and our discussions with the EPA, we made the recommendation to our leadership that we develop our own statewide program. And again, not speaking poorly of FRC, just for our needs, it, it wasn't a fit. And so um, throughout 2017, we worked to develop a recognition program. Um, that first bullet received branding exception to develop a unique logo was like way, way harder than it sounds. Um, in 2015, our state paid like $100,000 to get all our logos um, consolidated to that logo in the bottom left-hand corner. And I hope this doesn't 
go anywhere where somebody from the state can see me talking about that. But um, it was actually really controversial. Um, and so we had at, at the time like 3,000 logos and the state came down to, you know, 100. And in doing so, they put in a process uh, where you have to go through the governor's office to get approval to get a logo developed. So um, unbelievable amount of work to get a logo. Uh, there's also another process to get your own website. We went through that. Then we developed what a program framework would look like. We kind of um, looked at the, the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition has a We Compost program that's really cool. And so we looked at that as kind of a model. Um, and then we provided a stakeholder input opportunity of about one and a half months, comprised of 12 questions. And these kind of just helped us resolve some of our um, uncertainties related to the, the program structure. <laughs> And we had 62 responses, which was pretty good considering the you know, survey. Um, so the, the fun on all of this has been kind of uh, wonky, but uh, that is the logo we came up with. Um, we have a mission statement. Um, and so we, going through this process, developed a recognition program, but in developing the recognition program, we, we really realized that we had developed the state of Tennessee's um, organic management program itself. And so um, <clears throat> we now kind of view Get Food Smart as having two components. It has an education and awareness component, and then it also has this recognition program. In terms of education and awareness, we're still kind of mapping that out, what that looks like in the future. Um, right now, what we are doing is kind of piecemeal taking advantage of opportunities as they arise to um, push out information about food waste. So we had an opportunity through the National Metro Government and the Ad Council to put up some Save the Food promotional materials around town. And so we've got them in all the buses in town. We've got them on some electronic billboards. Um, through our um, TDEC communications department, we have been corresponding with local um, newspapers to push out information about our program or people in their regions that are doing things related to food waste um, when those opportunities arise. Um, we launched a, a website where we're hosting resources. Um, you know, we've got a meal planning guide. We've got sector-specific fact sheets um, and tips. And ultimately, we really want to make Get Food Smart kind of a three tenant program in that it has a recognition program, it has a statewide campaign aspect, and then eventually we would like it to have a technical component where we're actually doing programming. Um, so jumping to the recognition program, the way we structured it, we divided it into four categories, schools, restaurants, government entities, and nonprofits, and then kind of our catch-all at the bottom there. <coughs> Excuse me. To, to be considered for recognition, you need to satisfy at least five of up to 30 um, category-specific criteria. And those, those criteria are a mix of qualitative and quantitative action. So it could be putting up a poster in your place of business that speaks to food waste or putting a little uh, statement on your menu that says, you know, uh, take home leftovers or whatever it may be. Something to, you know, remind people about food waste. So the benefits of the recognition program, we've developed a door placard, so participating organizations get something to put outside their business. Um, like I previously mentioned, we have press releases and company highlights that we're pushing out to local newspapers through our communication group. Um, eventually, we hope to turn this into a peer network where people can, can uh, share best practices, and exchange information, as well as um, get technical assistance. Down the road, we're, we're shooting for 2.0 of our website to have a, a much more interactive um, promotional component to it where it has a news portal and, and more um, uh, success story based content um, regarding these companies or organizations. And then we're also going to do um, an annual uh, Food Smart Organization of the Year Award. And we have a Governor's Environmental Stewardship Award program that's been in place for like 25 years. And um, you know, really a prominent program. And so we're going to tack that onto that. 
So Outlook for the program, we formally launched our recognition program April 20th with a cool ceremony. And since then, we've, we've signed up about 105 participating locations across the state. You know, these are a lot of organizations that are already taking these actions, um, but the hope is that we can leverage their participation to encourage people to take actions they're not taking so that they can join. Um, through the rest of the year, we're going to promote the recognition program, continue to develop resources. Um, we're going to host a workshop to help us um, you know, learn about what we could do better with the program. And then hopefully next year, February, March, we're awarding our first um, Organization of the Year Award. So that's, that's it. I won't say that we took you know, the most um, clear pathway to developing a re recognition program, but we've certainly tried to be fairly intentional in how we've gone about this and seeking stakeholder input, kind of checking off low-hanging fruit, and then doing the more long-term program commitments um, as we move forward. So, thank you. Great, well thank you, Matt. Next up, we have Christina McDonough, is the Community Transformation Consultant at the Scott County Health Department, and has been involved with the Food Rescue Partnership since its onset in 2013. The Scott County Health Department collected data on 124 food system indicators and was the leading organization to assist the original work group of stakeholders in narrowing the focus to the percentage of food waste, industrial, commercial, uh, the food system indicator in developing a community improvement action plan. Christina earned her bachelor's in health promotion from the University of Northern Iowa and is a certified health education spe specialist. So thank me, help me. Oh, welcome, Christina. Okay. Good morning, everyone. The um, Food Rescue Partnership is really pleased to be here, but I always like to get started with a personal story from when I was a waitress in high school at Maid Right. And during one of our busy lunch rushes, there was a Maid Right that accidentally got ketchup on it, and the table really didn't want it. So the manager said, well, shoot, that's not good. Now I have to throw this in the trash. And I thought, well, hey, I like ketchup on my Maid Right. Can I take that to the back? And then when we're not busy, can I have that as my lunch? No, absolutely not. So I asked why. Well, it sets a poor example for a business model, right? You don't want your staff going around making mistakes and eating that for their lunch. And um, that story really kind of leads into what does it look like when someone is actually food insecure? So I want you to think throughout my presentation, what about those people that are food insecure? And carry that thought with you throughout the remainder of the Midwest Food Recovery Summit. Again, my name is Christina McDonough, and I am the vice chair of the Quad Cities Food Rescue Partnership. Can you hit play on the video, Aubrey? Nearly 600 million pounds of food enter Iowa landfills each year. That's almost 500 million meals being thrown away. Instead of feeding landfills, we could feed people who need it. The Food Rescue Partnership is working to eliminate food waste by partnering with businesses that will donate to food shelters and pantries, or for use as animal feed or compost. These businesses are helping to eliminate food waste and feed our local community. Visit foodrescueqc.org. Really proud of that video that was recently launched. It was created by middle school students. They're going a lot farther in life than I am with technology. <laughs> so how did the Food Rescue Partnership get started? In 2013, the Scott County Health Department, as one of our community transformation grant requirements, were asked to look at the food system in Scott County, Iowa. So throughout 124 different food and food system indicators, we collected data on a wide variety of information regarding how many farms are in Scott County, what those farms are producing, what uh, 
sort of fast food restaurants we have in the community and also what we are putting to the landfill for food waste. And throughout that data, we gathered um, also information on similar counties. So we're operating in Scott, and we have data on Black Hawk County, Johnson County, and Lynn County, which are all very similar in population to the Quad Cities community. This data was collected in 2014 and is measured in tons. So for those of you that are not number people, uh, there's 2,000 pounds in one ton. A little bit about our initial meetings and how this grew outside of the Scott County Health Department collecting data on our food system. We invited a wide variety of our community partners. Our first meeting was in December 2013. Five community partners attended, and we provided an overview of the food system assessment and worked on prioritizing indicators one through three. And so a score of one was something that we deemed that was moderately important, and three was the most important. In January 2014, we had eight community partners attend a meeting, and we narrowed out of the 124 food system indicators to our top five. In March, with four community partners, we narrowed it down to three. And in May, we selected the percentage of food waste indicator to develop a community action plan for. So we began development of that action plan and really started an overview of research of food rescue organizations because we didn't want to duplicate services and this was the first time that the Scott County Health Department was ever involved in anything related to the food system outside of restaurant inspections. Um, this is a look of our current stakeholder and community partner list. So we're averaging approximately 10 community partners throughout our meetings. Um, we have representation from colleges, food banks, and then both health departments in the Quad Cities area. And our partners are worth mentioning because those are very valuable members in our community that are also involved with the Food Rescue Partnership. They're not attending the meetings, however, we know that we can call on them at any point and they're willing to give us a helping hand. This is our current board makeup. Our board chair, Pete Vogel, is a community member. He's been a lifelong community member of the Quad Cities and is volunteering his time. And he's actually sitting here today, so I would like Pete to raise his hand. It's very rare that you have a community member that's willing to volunteer their time and commit to a project that they're not getting paid for throughout the work day. Um, we've heard a lot about my involvement at the health department. Kristen is the newly appointed board secretary, and Kristen is responsible for providing nutrition education out of the University of Illinois Extension office. And it very closely ties to some of the food study programs that she started doing at the Sherrard Illinois School District. Larry Linenbrink is our newly retired community member. Um, he actually retired from the Scott County Health Department a few years ago, and we called him out in one meeting, asked him to continue to attend as a community member, and he has continued to attend meetings and is currently serving as the treasurer. So a little bit about that um, food rescue collection we were doing for information. We really wanted to find out what was working well in other communities that we had also collected data on their food waste. One of the first organizations that we reached out to is Table to Table in Iowa City. It's a nonprofit organization. How many of you have heard of Table to Table? Good. And they're actually going to be presenting on Thursday. Um, so. Really, um, in short, they're transportation based. So how do you get food that's willing to be donated from point A to point B? And rather than calling point B yourself, if you're the point A, let's contact Table Table. They'll take care of all of the logistics for you. So the phone calls, the tracking, the transportation. Um, and it's working out very well in Iowa City. Another organization um, that we were introduced from staff at the time from Table to Table was, hey, you should call Aubrey at Eat Greater Des Moines. And so we actually reached out to our moderator in this session, Aubrey, and she provided us information on what they're doing in Des Moines, um, which at the time was very communication oriented and they were working very hard on figuring out an app 
app that would alert those nonprofit hunger relief agencies to when a restaurant had food. Um, and she also will be presenting on Thursday, so you can catch her session as well and learn a great more deal about Table Table and Eat Greater Des Moines. So what's gonna work for the Quad Cities? Two great nonprofit organizations are doing great work in each of their communities, but the Quad Cities is unique to our area. And so we decided that we would develop a food rescue questionnaire. The food rescue questionnaire asks simple questions. Are you currently donating food? If yes, what type of food are you donating? How frequently are you donating the food? And is there anything that could be improved with the food donation process? And if no, we ask two questions at the bottom of the survey. Why not? And what can we do to motivate you to begin donating food? So we're currently revamping that survey and also launching it. So you can see side by side here data that was collected during the initial round in 2016 and then in 2018. So the top need was education and awareness. When we were making phone calls and stopping by the restaurants and grocery stores in the Quad Cities, they were unaware that food donation was an option to reducing their food waste in the kitchen. How many of you had to finish your dinner plate growing up. Your parents said there's starving kids somewhere. Were those starving kids always abroad in your house? They were always like in Africa for me. Did anybody's parents have the same story but said in our own neighborhood? Hand up? No, usually there's one. Um, yes. Yes, exactly. So growing up, I knew that there was hunger abroad, but again, I didn't really think of it as being a Midwest problem. I didn't think of food insecurity. It never registered as a child or even as a young adult. And so as I learned more about the food system in Scott County, I thought, well, certainly I'm not the only one that's uninformed of a dilemma that we have in our very own community. So we partnered with Augustina College, GIS students, and these students collected data on where grocery stores are, uh, what uh, the food pantries are located at, farmers markets, convenience stores, and they came up with this really great map. And this map showcases where the food deserts are in Scott County, Iowa, in Rock Island County, Illinois. This is on our website. It's very interactive. When you visit our Food Rescue Partnership website, you can go in and add layers and remove them as you wish. So I encourage you to check out this map if it's something that would be beneficial. College students are really willing and motivated to work on projects that are gonna be used in real life. So as we're collecting a little bit more information that's unique to the Quad Cities on what the restaurants want, they want education awareness when it comes to food rescue. We have all of this data on the farms and the food system indicators in Scott County. What are we gonna do now that we have all of these great community partners around the table? How are we gonna provide education to those that can make an impact in our community? So we developed a resource guide specific to our community. And Pete actually has several folders that he's gonna pass around so you can skim through this resource guide. Um, please feel free if it's information that's helpful to you, keep the folder. Um, if it's something that you know of someone we wanna get those out and pass those around. It's also available on our website to download. But the resource guide just provides basic information on what type of food is safe to donate. Where can I donate it in the Quad Cities? There's a ton of places. Give me two people to call. Don't give me 100 people to call. And so it really walks through a lot of those logistics and goes over some of the onset of the Food Rescue Partnership. In addition, we started planning our first food rescue workshop that took place in October 2015. And what we decided to do since our target population was really those grocery store managers and managers or owners of the restaurants in our community, we hosted two sessions with identical content, um, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, so that we could accommodate those that had to either prep for a lunch rush or a dinner rush and they could pick which one worked for them. And so we had panel discussions on um, what Table Table's doing, Eat Greater Des Moines, and then our Riverbend Food Bank, which is the food bank of the Quad Cities community. 
And then we also had a panel discussion of Outback Steakhouse and the affiliate that they're donating their food to. And then our mom and pop restaurant, Ross's restaurant, and what it looks like on their level with um, much limited resources and who they're donating food to. We also had a great networking session, a bunch of people around that could answer questions and the whole goal was to get someone connected there to begin donating food. In addition, um, the Scott County Health Department and the Rock Island County Health Department, which do all of the licensings and inspections, added information to our website. So this is how it would appear on the Scott County website when people are going to update their food license and go through the renewal process. There's a component on food rescue and it links them to our website and our Facebook page. We also have ServeSafe classes. Are any of you familiar with ServeSafe and what that is? Okay. So for for those of you that are not familiar with it and people that are preparing your food, they have to go through um, food safety training that tells them all of the recommendations for keeping food at safe temperatures and storing it properly. And so I am now allowed 10 to 15 minutes to present on the Food Rescue Partnership before each Serve Safe class. It's a really great group to get the word out there. Um, Mention partnering with local universities and colleges. Another one that we partnered with in the Quad Cities is St. Ambrose University in Davenport. And they have a um, campaign PR class that work together on collecting research on the Food Rescue Partnership. Since we've been around since 2013, um, we're still working to get the word out in the community. So they did research on how many Google searches we showed up on, and then also made recommendations for how we can continue to grow in our community. Um, a lot of it was that we needed to find a free intern to come up with a lot of great marketing materials for us. And we also established our own food rescue recognition program in our community. So we are endorsers of the EPA Food Recovery Challenge, but we also wanted to make something more local to the Quad Cities because that's how we identify in our community. And so as you can see, we're um, working on getting the word out. Regarding it, our application process is very simple. So we want to know who you're donating to and uh, how frequently you're donating. And then we also, um, in the last year, expanded that to what efforts are you doing for compost or f animal feed? So if you're hitting anything on that EPA food recovery hierarchy, you can be recognized as a member of Food Rescue. Members are awarded a certificate and a window cling. They're promoted on our website and our Facebook page. So it's a little bit of free advertising for them, which they're very excited about. So more information about the EPA Food Recovery Challenge. It made great sense for us to become endorsers of the challenge because we're already promoting the EPA um, food recovery hierarchy and source reduction and everything affiliated to that. And so the two complemented each other very well. We have our second workshop coming up. So if anybody's free on Thursday, October 4th, and you want to visit the Quad Cities, there's a great workshop going to be taking place in Davenport. Um, we're putting together a keynote presentation from a very innovative chef in our community that's well known. And he's going to talk a lot about how you can motivate the employees and get them encouraged in food rescue. And then just different things that you can do in the kitchen to be creative. And let's focus on your own kitchen and you purchase the those materials to use um, for your restaurant. So what can you do to make sure that you're using them to the full capability? I like sharing information on Iowa resources. So hopefully this is a good group to share it with. I see a few Iowa faces here. Um, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources has many resources, but I wanted to particularly mention the Solid Waste Alternatives Program grants. They are provided quarterly for projects including source reduction, recycling, and education. Over the last few years, there have been many projects related to food waste and rescue that have been funded through this program. 
The Iowa Food Waste Stakeholder Coalition is very similar to the Food Rescue Partnership in Nature. It's looking at food recovery at a statewide level in all areas of the EPA hierarchy I mentioned earlier. This group is currently developing a comprehensive white paper detailing barriers to food recovery in Iowa and strategies needed at all levels to push Iowa to become a leader in food waste reduction and recovery. The Iowa Waste Exchange is also a part of the Iowa DNR. The best way to describe this program is by saying that one man's trash is another's treasure. Um, the Iowa Waste Exchange representatives provide free assistance to help find someone who wants your trash. Um, for example, a restaurant that has vegetable scraps or spoiled produce that can't be donated um, for human consumption can go for anaerobic digestion. And lastly, the Iowa Waste Reduction Center at the University of Northern Iowa, who is um, responsible for this great conference, has been focusing on food waste reduction and landfill diversion, particularly from an environmental perspective over the past um, several years. They've developed numerous resources that can be used, but also provide free technical assistance, such as troubleshooting, composting problems, and um, conducting waste sorts. We're fortunate enough that that one of the Iowa Waste Reduction staff lives in the Quad Cities and is an active stakeholder in the Food Rescue Partnership. Um, so all of these are really great resources. We've utilized numerous ones and are involved with the Iowa Food Waste Stakeholder Coalition. And lastly, I'd like you to like us on Facebook and be sure to check out our website. We have a lot of really great information on there. So that GIS map that I showed you with the food deserts, the resource guide, it's all out there available for use. Please feel free to use any of it that might be helpful. All right, we're gonna ask our presenters to come back up. Don't go anywhere, Christina, okay. Uh, so that we can have an opportunity for questions. And I am going to pass around the microphone, so while it might be easy for us to hear each other in the room, they are filming these sessions and it's hard for the people that are watching through the film to hear your questions, and I'm sure you're full of good ones. So, who wants to kick it off with their first question? Question for the first speaker. Um, I, I went to, when I went to school. Um, I didn't have access to a lunch program. We brought our lunches. There was no food waste. <laughs> um, is there any pilot or anybody looking at trying to take this food waste uh, issue at these cafeterias and put it up to the parents that are bringing these kids to schools, pack them a lunch that they're going to like to eat instead of the cafeteria trying to decide what students are going to want to eat and then having all this waste. One of the things that you might have saw in the statistics that I provided was the percentage of students that are in this county that um, are eligible for government assistance for food lunches. So when you're talking about students that don't have um, access at home or, you know, parents that have uh, the finances to really do what you're talking about, and it's kind of a different environment in some ways, um, it, it's, it's very hard to think about putting that back on parents when we have students that are hungry because their parents aren't, don't have food to feed them. So looking at that, I think, you know, what we should do to, um, in the communication part of it and really the, the portion of it to encourage, um, you know, looking at what foods are popular with kids and, and trying to investigate that and, and serving food that the kids want to eat of course, they have to meet the USDA guidelines, and there's so many rules and regulations, and it's really tough. Um, I know schools still struggle with share tables. I heard that when I was working on this project, knowing what they can put on the table and can't put on the table. And um, it's, it's, it's a really tough question, but I think that uh, the first response I would say is look at what you're making, what foods are popular, is there foods that none of the, you know, that mostly the kids aren't eating, then don't make that and find a different strategy. Yeah. Thank you. All right, what else? I, I'm going to respond to that because we 
did, we We've done a very, uh, we did a 12 school pilot here in Iowa, and that was the same sort of perception that we had, and we approached the Department of Education on that, like why are you making these things when, but they have to. Right. Um, quite honestly, they have to have certain colors of vegetables. They have to have proteins, and proteins can incorporate beans. And I think we all know a lot of little kids don't love a variety of beans. So um, we, we, we understand that's still a challenge for us in working with the, the Iowa schools. Um, we've, we've talked to them about you know what can you sort of rotate more frequently in and out of the menu, but more importantly, what we're trying to do, and we'll need to work with USDA on some of this, is is for what we're, we're finding is portion size. They have the same flat portion size for a five-year-old to a 12-year-old. Um, and the other issue we encompassed here in the state was a, was that confusion around the share tables. Uh, and, but we recently worked with Department of Inspection and Appeals, um, Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals, and Department of Education to create what they what we're calling a variance, so that schools can apply to DIA for variance, so that they could put other things on the share table that weren't traditionally specified and we just kind of got over that hurdle in the last three months so, so that's great I'd like to you know talk with you about that so you know if there's things that we can learn from things Iowa's done then you know and share that in Kansas that would be great Thank maybe you. it's an opportunity to call Congressman Young and suggest some federal changes so he asked us to call him yesterday so add him on the list what other questions do we have? This question is from Matt. Well, sorry about that. Um, it's very loud, Mike. You had a, you guys created that food waste grant program. Where did you secure that funding from for that? Yeah, so we're really fortunate in Tennessee in that we have a uh, tipping fee surcharge placed on every ton of waste that goes to a municipal solid waste landfill. So for every ton we get a dollar twenty-five, thirty-five cents of that goes to our solid waste regulatory program for oversight. The other um, ninety cents goes to our recycling program. Those funds are redistributed across the state through granting programs um, and we will develop these grants that are made available periodically. So this organics management grant is gonna be offered again in early 2019. So it's it's a, it's just a funding structure that's based in statute. So. Okay, and you had also uh, your white paper, you had nine, I think, uh, suggestions or ideas for upstream with, mm -hmm. uh, could you share some of those with us? Oh gosh! Um, Just a couple. You know, the Sarah. Nine. One of them was the recognition program, and and hopefully this will be made available because I I have a link to that report at the bottom of that slide. Um, you know, it was a recognition program. There was consideration of expanding the state's donor li liability protections. Um, some of it was as simple as um, making more information regarding donor liability protections publicly available. And we kind of um, ranked those actions based on um, uh, resources required to accomplish those and, and length of time. So, you know, the, the first recommendation was the simplest and lowest cost. So, um, if this is not made available, I'm happy to give you my contact and share that with you. Uh, follow up on the, uh, your answer just now. How long have you had the tipping fee surcharge? Um, I, gosh, I think 1984, don't quote me on that, um, so, maybe it's early 90s. So it's well established. It's well established, yeah. Um, and then we also have um, a statute that allows uh, local solid waste authorities to develop their own tipping surcharge. So, for instance, um, Davidson County, which is where Nashville is, has a county tipping surcharge of $5. So they get five dollars on every ton of waste generated in Davidson County to fund their own recycling programs and own outreach. So 
Um, there's not a ton of, of communities that have a local solid waste authority tipping surcharge just because of the political dynamics of the state, but it's another provision that's available. May I ask a follow-up? Uh, and you kind of led me to that. Uh, so in our state, we're considering a tipping fee surcharge right now, and it's a fairly large issue that's going to happen in the next few months. Uh, and the pushback to it has been more of a free market dynamics opposition. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, but I don't, uh, we wouldn't generally consider Tennessee as a state that we would associate with a non-free market approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious how that's perceived locally. Um, so honestly, the, the main local opposition to the issue is kind of the bureaucratic framework that comes with it. And so you have local governments that are, um, remitting this surcharge to us to have a state program that tells them what to do. So, I mean, in all honesty, I think the counties would much rather, or the solid waste planning regions would much rather have that money remitted to them so they can run their own programs. Um, you know, from a, from a envi maximizing environmental impact life cycle assessment, you know, if we can take as much money as possible and focus on the largest areas, we can, um, you know, get the largest recycling benefit, um, you know, have the largest footprint reduction, but it's all very controversial. And, and two years ago, we had actually looked at increasing the surcharge and non-starter. So we kind of got it, we're happy we have it, and um, we did have a surcharge on tires and we, we administered a very similar program specifically with recycling tires and, and um, end of life disposal of tires. And those funds were actually taken back over by the county. So we, we did lose that funding, so. Are there any other questions? Thank you. This question's for Christina. Um, those maps were really cool that you had put together, specifically the ones that identified the food deserts. Was that just for Scott County or was that for the whole quad city area that you guys identified the food deserts in? Scott County and Rock Island County in Illinois. Okay. And how many food deserts do you have? It was really scattered throughout the rural communities, as mm -hmm. you would imagine, with the um, one-mile buffer to the five-mile buffer. Uh, we didn't go through and identify each of them. It's just the broad outlier areas of, you know, where the population tends to dwindle um, out from the metropolitan area. And is there anything you guys are, are doing uh, now that you've identified those areas? We've been working quite a bit with Riverbend Food Bank in our community and one of their goals, um, they were surprised that there was more food insecurity in Scott County, Iowa. And so they've been working a great deal with a lot of the um, city of Davenport and the county administrator as well on what levels food can be increased as far as the access in those rural communities. So, Christina, this question's for you. I noticed you had some listings of restaurants in the Quad City area, like Outback. I think there was Dairy Queen. Yes. Um, are those franchise owners? Because I know that we've had some challenges when you're dealing with restaurants that maybe are national chains. So, or do you know that? Yes, they both are franchise owners. So Outback Steakhouse, um, organization-wide, all of them are mandated to donate to a nonprofit hunger relief agency in their community. So they're able to select which nonprofit in their community they want to donate to. For Dairy Queen specifically, it was just that owner. She was very motivated to make an impact in the community and her food donations um, are usually of the treat nature. So it usually is donated to the local fire department that's right down the street or to the different workplaces. Uh, she's also well known in the community that if a freezer's going out and she's gonna have to throw the food away because the health department's gonna come in and tell her to, they'll reach out to the local radio station and get that word out there. And so they're really doing everything they can. And um, her specific location shuts down for the winter. And so any of the food that they have, they don't 
store it over the winter. They um, donate that to a nonprofit, and then they start from scratch at the beginning of the year. I know we've seen a lot of uh, the national groups use Food Donation Connection, which is a national mm -hmm. organization. So like Olive Garden, Darden Restaurants, that's how they usually get their initial connection. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have time for one more? We don't really have time, but if anyone's got one. <laughs> I mean, I'm a bad moderator. <laughs> All right. Well, let's say thank you to everyone for attending. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. So please remember to rate the session on the Summit app. And the next session in this room will be Legalize It, Feeding Livestock Food Waste.